Okay, so now we're going to start number 87 from your final study guide. On number 87, we have this formula, P sub T, which don't let that notation bother you. That's just like our F of X notation that tells us this is a function. It could be F of X, or it could just say Y equals, but it just means, hey, this is a function. Um, and time is the input variable. Instead of an X, we're using time as the variable in use here, uh, the input variable. So uh, we're looking for time in this problem. We've got a problem where we've got the original population uh, of some town is 11,653 people. E to the rate is um, already changed to a decimal and then times time. So if we put in one year, it tell me how much it grew after a year, two years, and so on. Uh, but our question on this, when you read number 87, it says, um, let me read that to you. The growth in a population of a city can be seen using this formula, where T is the number of years since 1970. So that is important to note that this is the model they used starting at time zero would be in 1970. Um, and then the question is, according to this formula, how many years will it take for the population to double its 1970 value and then round to the nearest tenth of a year? I want you to notice this formula is very, um, similar to our PERT formula. They're really just using our PERT formula. PERT formula is the compound interest or the compounding formula, continuous compounding, where you have a PE to the RT. So it's, it's just already input the P value, the starting amount of people, E, and it already has the rate in it and the time. So our question is when does it double? You could, if you want to go through all of the process without any shortcutting it, to double means this would be twice over here. The output value would be twice what it started out as. So uh, the double of 11,653, I'm going to times that on my calculator. And so the, the value it grows to is 23306. And that's what double would look like. Then to solve this equation, the first thing, since that's times, I could divide out the 11,653 to each side. We get that to cancel, leaving e to the rate and time still there. But this should always, if you're doubling, divide out to be 2. So I've talked to you about using a shortcut, which is if it's a doubling time problem, it's always, no matter what the starting value is, whether they even tell you the starting value, you don't even need to know it, because if it's a doubling time problem, it always reduces to 2 equals the ERT. The p-value divides itself out and equals 2 RT. So that's the shortcut for any doubling time. If it was tripling, it'd be three. If it's a half-life, you do half-lives, it's a half equals e to the RT, and so on and so forth. You really don't even need this information, but if they provide it, it just makes it maybe a little more interesting to see the values. But anyway, here's your equation to solve. So to solve that, I would take the logarithm of each side so I can get the exponent to come down as a multiplier. So you get L and a 2, the exponent now in front is a multiplier on L and of E. L and of E is a special value, you can check it on your calculator, but it is always 1 because it means base E to what power is E, the meaning of that logarithm, so it reduces to just a 1, which is nice, it makes it easier to calculate with. So this times 1 just kind of eliminates that there. Then to solve for t, since it's multiplied, we can divide out that multiplier. We have to do the same thing to each side, leaving t alone. So t equals, and then button pushing um, will tell us our time. Now, this is what I call a short shortcut. If you understand, and I'll, I'll like for you to understand how we got to this point, um, but then you can use this short shortcut, which is the algebra every time works out to where if you're doing the, the doubling time, you, you take the ln of each side to solve this, to bring this down, but then the ln of e kind of cancels out because it's one. And so you just have the ln of two on this side and you have to divide by the rate to solve. So every time you work a doubling time problem, you could really say the formula for doubling time is ln of two divided by the rate. So this is even a shorter shortcut uh, for doing a doubling. ln of 2 divided by the rate. Um, if it's tripling, ln of 3 divided by the rate, and so on. If it's a half-life, ln of a half divided by the rate. So you might
might want to uh, think of it in those terms. But, uh, but there is the reasoning for it. All right, moving on to uh, number 88. Number 88, f of x equals e to the x minus 1 plus 3 uh, is our function. It says find its inverse function. The directions say find f inverse of x, that means the inverse function, and give domain and range of, domain and range of that, of the inverse. All right, so let's talk about the original function first to make sure it's one-to-one. -one. We talked about, and in, in, uh, this is actually takes us back a little bit to the inverse talk. An inverse must, have, must be one-to-one -to, -one to get an inverse, so what about this first equation? Y equals e to the x minus 1 plus 3. We talked about exponential functions. If this is a base 2 function, we did a lot of base 2 functions, or it could be base 3, uh, but whatever the base function is, um, it basically looks the same. Uh, an exponential function with a base 2, 3, 4, greater than 1, is an increasing function going through the point 0, 1. So E is 2.7818. It's just a little more than 2. So it's very similar to, if you can just kind of imagine that's 2 to the x minus 1, um, it's going to look a lot like that. It'll have a little sharper, curvature might be a little different. You know, it's not the exact same graph, but it's very similar. So we can kind of visualize it like this. And then these are our shifting rules. The, um, anything grouped with the x like that is going to shift it horizontally. So that's the horizontal shift. And we know the horizontal shift is opposite. So it's going to move at a positive 1. And then this is the vertical shift. And that one is what it is. It, it, it's positive 3, it goes up 3 like you would think. So vertical shift, horizontal shift. So from 0, 1, we're going to move it over 1 and up 3. So I did that because I'm going to go ahead and find the domain and range of that function. And then when I do my inverse, um, it's going to switch those around. They have a class, maybe? Hmm? They don't have a class. They're not class. Okay. So what's the domain and range of this shifted function? We've seen that it's been moved up three places. Normally, the exponential function has a range of 0 to infinity. It goes up from 0, and this is an asymptote, the original exponential function. So when we moved it vertically up 3, it has a range of 3 to infinity. It goes from 3 on up. Now, its domain is left and right. You can see this thing opens left and right without bound. So that's the original function, just to get an idea. It is definitely one-to-one. -one. Nothing repeats vertically or horizontally, so there's no repeats. So it does have an inverse. And when we find its inverse, we'll have its domain and range, because we can switch those. You know, the inverse function, domain and range, flip-flop. All right, so we'll have that done. But how do we find that inverse function? Once we determine it's one-to-one, -one, then we rearrange the equation switching the x and y. Inverses the x and y switch, so it's x equals e to the y minus 1 plus 3. Then we solve that equation. Remember, we rearrange it then for the new y, so we want the 3 thrown across, x minus 3. Then this is an exponent. To get it to come down, that's a logarithm move. You have to take the log, and I want to take the ln log. Anytime I see e is in the problem, it'll make it an easier calculation. So we have the ln of this side, the ln of the x minus 3 side, and then y minus 1 is brought down in front of the ln of e. ln of e, we said, is 1, so we cancel that out. And then to solve for y, we just need to throw that 1 across the line. So we have the ln of x minus 3, now plus 1 equals y. So this is now our inverse function. We've rearranged it. Um, and instead of calling it y, we call that f inverse of x equals this stuff. So maybe write it on the other side. It looks more natural. So that's our inverse function. You can look at your choices for that. Uh, and then it's domain and range. We go back to that. We've got to list that as well. Switch places. So the domain would be the range of the original. And its range would be the domain of the original. And then when you look at your answer choices, there's only one that has all that. Okay, number 89. 
Number 89, we go back to a sort of perp problem like we had on 87. Uh, sometimes they write this with different variables and different applications, so don't let that bother you. Um, it's still an application of PERT, the continuous compounding formula. This is our p-value. Our a sub zero means our starting value. A lot of times in the science application, instead of using p for principal, they'll use a sub zero or y sub zero, which just means the initial amount present. So the starting amount times e to the rate times time. Instead of using r this time, they use k for the constant rate of growth of decay equals y or equals a or equals whatever function notation they want to use there. But it's basically P-E-R-T, like the PERT formula in essence. And if you read through it, it tells you the, the final line says you're going to determine the half-life. So once you see it says it's a half-life problem, you can jump to your shortcut and work it that way if you understand the reasoning behind that. And I'm going to show it in all the steps. Uh, so the problem says in the formula given, the A is the amount of radioactive material remaining from an initial amount, A sub zero, initial amount, at a given time, T, and K is a negative constant determined by the nature of the material. A certain radioactive isotope decays at a rate of 0.125% annually. So there's the percent given that goes in the, the formula for the rate of decay. And it is decaying, so it'll be a negative rate. So we'll move this to left to get rid of the percent sign, and then because it's decaying, that will be negative. That is the rate amount that goes right there. Um, and this is determine the half-life. So determine, to determine the half-life means when is this initial amount, whether it was 50 grams, 100 pounds, whatever unit to measure, it becomes half of itself over here in the output. So this would be half of a, a sub zero equals a sub zero. E, we're plugging in our rate, and T is totally unknown. That's what we're trying to figure out. How long does it take it to half itself, a half life? So the first step is that's a multiplier, so we can divide out the A sub zero. So like we've talked about in some former problems, you really don't have to know how many grams or ounces or whatever that is, because if it's if it's given as a half or a doubling or whatever increment of time, that always just reduces out anyway. Uh, so sometimes they tell you and sometimes not. But here we divide out the a sub zero and we have one half equals e to the rate times time. So that's what I call your shortcut. A half equals r when it's a half-life problem. Then to solve that, we take the ln of each side because by taking the logarithm, exponents are multiplied. We have ln of a half equals, our exponent brought down as a multiplier on ln of e. Now if you can read that, ln of e, ln of e, we talked about how that's one, so you can kind of mark through that, and it's multiplied by this. Um, then to get t alone, we divide out this rate. That cancels. We always do the same thing to each side to keep the balance. So the time will be ln of a one half divided by Right. And we punch that on our calculator carefully. Make sure you close your argument of your logs. Type that in correctly. The answer key for number 89 tells me it should be A, which is um, 555 years to the nearest amount of years. That's how long it takes it to become.